If you think Leviathan is a fire-breathing dinosaur, then you are missing out on so much of what the Bible has to offer on this really important topic. If you're still stuck on Leviathan is a dinosaur, you just won't know what the whole story is all about because you don't know what Leviathan is and how Jesus is going to defeat him. In fact, by the end of this video, you will be absolutely shocked by the number of scriptures that reference Leviathan from Genesis to Exodus to the major prophets to the minor prophets to Psalms to Job to Proverbs constantly mentions Leviathan. And you probably don't know about all these references because you have never been told where to look. When people think about Leviathan in scripture, they usually only think of one passage at the end of Job. The passage describes in great detail Leviathan as a massive sea beast with scales and fire for breath. It is impossible to tame and extremely deadly. As I will explain in this video, I do not believe that Leviathan is a literal member of the animal kingdom. But there are generally two reasons why people think that Leviathan is an animal here. The first reason is that he and Behemoth are described at the end of a list of literal creatures. Now, this isn't too convincing of an argument since Job is a highly poetic book in general. If the author wanted to cap off his list with a metaphorical dragon figure like Leviathan, he could certainly do so. Also, there actually is a significant gap in the text between the real, literal creatures and Behemoth and Leviathan. It seems that the author of Job is intentionally singling these two out as different from the rest of the creatures in his list. The second argument that Leviathan is a literal creature is that the description of Leviathan is way too detailed to be describing a simple metaphor. However, the problem with this argument is that there is no obvious limit to how detailed a metaphor can be. Ezekiel 16 and Revelation 17 both contain metaphors that are significantly longer than that of Job 41, yet they are still metaphors. Secondly, the lengthy descriptions of Leviathan and Job are not there to narrate a National Geographic special. They are there for dramatic emphasis. This is quite clear from the fact that often multiple details are spelled out in the text that when closely examined are only really one detail. Carefully study the text and you will realize that all of the so-called detailed descriptions are really only there to teach us a handful of facts. So with those two arguments out of the way, are there any good reasons that we should think that Leviathan is a metaphor? Well, let's start with Psalm 74, which describes the creation of the world. Yet God my king is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might, you broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters, you crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. It seems here that Leviathan has multiple heads. What a strange description if he's supposed to be a dinosaur. Yet before we dig deeper into Psalm 74, I want you to take a look at Isaiah's mini apocalypse in chapter 26 starting in verse 20. Come my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. I started in chapter 26 to make it absolutely clear that this is about the day of the Lord, the day when Jesus will return to judge the nations and destroy all of his enemies. It says that in that day, he will come and will destroy Leviathan. Now, how strange is it that Leviathan would be destroyed at the end of days if Leviathan is just a dinosaur? Besides which, there aren't any dinosaurs anymore, so where is Jesus going to find one of these Mosasauruses or Plesiosaurs in order to kill when he returns? Now, I want you to take a look at this verse again and compare it with a pagan text found in the nearby location of Ugarit. When you smote Litanu, the fleeing serpent, annihilated the twisting serpent, the dominant one who has seven heads. According to Ben Stanhope, the consonants that form the word Litanu are contained in the Hebrew consonants for Leviathan. This most likely means that Leviathan and Litanu are variations on the same name, but in different languages. Beyond this, both Leviathan in Psalm 74 and Litanu in this text are described as having multiple heads, seven heads to be specific. And while we're on the topic of seven-headed mythical sea dragons, can you think of any other seven-headed beast that comes up out of the sea? Just a hint of where this video is going. Additionally, Ola Wikander argues that the words fleeing and twisting are so rare in both Hebrew and Ugaritic that the use of these words in both texts by chance is unthinkable. Isaiah 27 is clearly borrowing elements from the earlier Ugarit text, and this is well known in biblical scholarship. 
Yet, Isaiah is not the only biblical author to reference the fleeing serpent Litanu. In fact, this requires us to go back to the book of Job, but this time in chapter 26. By his power he stilled the sea, by his understanding he shattered Rahab, by his wind the heavens were made fair, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Job 26 uses the alternative biblical name for Leviathan. Rahab. Just like the Isaiah text, this references the fleeing serpent from the Ugaritic myth. This is important because it proves that just like the authors of Psalm 74 and Isaiah, the author of Job was aware that Leviathan had multiple heads. And just like Psalm 74, Job mentions the crushing of Leviathan in the context of the creation of the world. Do you know of any serpentine water dinosaur with multiple heads? It's at this point where some colorful individuals will still say, well, we've never dug up such a dinosaur, but I mean, God's all powerful, so couldn't he create such a creature literally? My response is that Psalm 91 says God will cover you with his feathery wings. Why shouldn't we take this as literal? He's God. If he wants to, he can conjure up feathery wings to literally cover us. He's all powerful, so why couldn't he? But that's not supposed to be taken literally, you say. But why should it not be taken literally? Well, because it's obvious that God doesn't have gigantic feathery wings. That would be crazy, you say. But is that any more crazy than taking a seven-headed, serpentine, fire-breathing water dragon that is slain in order to create the world as literal? The feathery wings cross the line, but that doesn't? Who are you to say that feathery wings are too outlandish to be taken literally, yet multi-headed fire-breathing water dragons are totally normal? But maybe you say, well, the feathery wings text is in Psalms, which is full of poetry. Yet the book of Job is also clearly poetry. By what standard do you say Leviathan is literal, yet feathery wings are not? Or do you just secretly really hope that Leviathan is a dinosaur, and so you twist the text and force it to come up with that interpretation? Consider Isaiah 60, 16, which says you shall nurse at the breasts of kings. Should we take this as literal? I mean, if God wanted to fulfill this literally, could he not do so? Who are you to answer back to God and say that he won't fulfill this literally? The Bible says that they will suck on the breasts of kings, and I believe it. Of course I'm being silly, because the question is not could God have people suck on the breasts of kings, or could God create feathery wings to cover us? It's not could God create a seven-headed fire-breathing water dragon. The only question that matters is did God actually wish to convey these things, or did he wish to convey something else? Did God wish to convey that Leviathan literally exists, or did he wish to convey something else? Therefore, the question, could God, is irrelevant. The only question that matters is, did God? So how then can we know if Leviathan is a literal creature or not? Well, the same way we understand any concept in scripture. We go to each of the texts in which Leviathan appears, and then we see what way best interprets all of them. So far, we've only seen four texts about Leviathan, yet each one of them raises serious problems for the literal interpretation. Job 41 describes Leviathan as fire-breathing. At the very least, this is odd and clues us in that things may not be purely literal. Psalm 74 and Job 26 say Leviathan was killed in order to create the world. But why would God need to slaughter a poor plesiosaur as an act of creation? They also say or imply in the case of Job 26 that it has multiple heads, which pretty much rules out every dinosaur I've ever heard of. Also, have you noticed that every single reference to Rahab or Leviathan is singular? Scripture has no concept of multiple Leviathans. Leviathan, or Rahab, is an entity according to Scripture. Take a look at where Rahab is used in Job chapter 9. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. So apparently there are helpers of Rahab, singular. There are not helpers of Rahabs. Rahab is not a species of animal. It's not a type of creature. Rahab is singular. And for that matter, if Rahab's a dinosaur, why does he need helpers? This just doesn't make any sense if we view this as literal. The dinosaur view also doesn't make sense of Isaiah 27, which says that this same Leviathan, who God apparently already killed as an act of creation, will be killed again at the end of days. Why would God need to kill a Mosasaur when Jesus returns? Again, this is definitely odd if taken literally, just as it would be odd for the Israelites to literally suck on King's nipples to fulfill Isaiah 60. It's possible, but not likely. So if Leviathan isn't a dinosaur, then what exactly is he? I've mentioned that I don't think Leviathan is a literal member of the animal kingdom, but what then do I think he is? Leviathan is the ancient world's mythical personification of chaos evil and destruction in the world. Notice that Job uses poetic language to communicate that Leviathan is one, destructive, two, undefeatable, and three, untamable. What is more destructive, undefeatable, and untamable than pure chaos itself? 
An example would be a hurricane. That's something that could strike whenever it wants to, it is highly destructive, and there's nothing we can do to tame it or destroy it. The hurricane just does what it wants. What about a tsunami or a famine? Each one of these could end you and everyone in your village, and there's nothing you could do about it. Even another tribe of savage raiders coming down to rape the women and slaughter the men and steal the food count as agents of chaos. Society was always surrounded by chaos, both from man and nature, and any cataclysm could cause the waters of chaos to destroy the meager patch of order that there was. You never knew if there would be a drought, a plague of locusts, or an invading army to kill you and all of those whom you love. You see, if Leviathan represents chaos and calamity, then all of these things are Leviathan. And therefore, if Leviathan is chaos, then it makes perfect sense of Job 41, while the literal view does not. What about Psalm 74 and Job 26? Well, if Leviathan simply represents chaos in the world, then it would make sense that in order for God to create an ordered world for humanity to dwell in, then he would need to subdue chaos and therefore defeat Leviathan. Additionally, God killing a supernatural watery chaos dragon in order to create the world is a common motif in ancient literature. It would be just as easily recognized as Santa Claus in our own culture. Consider the story of Tiamat. Depending on which version of the story you read, Enlil or Marduk of the Babylonians was said to have slaughtered the great serpentine sea dragon Tiamat by crushing her skull, much like in Psalm 74 and Job 26. Just like Leviathan, Tiamat represents the primordial waters of chaos, out of which the world was formed. In fact, after his victory, Marduk cut Tiamat in half to create both heaven and earth. Yet Tiamat is not the only ancient example of a heroic god slaying a mythical representative of chaos. From the previously mentioned Litanu, who was slain by the hero of the Canaanites, Baal, to the god Yam, who was defeated by Baal in order to attain supremacy among the gods, to Apophis, the ancient Egyptian serpentine god of chaos and destruction who battled Ra every morning. These stories pop up so often in the ancient world that scholars have actually developed a whole term for them, namely chaos comp. We can even see these ideas spread to Greco-Roman religion with the idea of a hydra, a mythological multi-headed serpentine dragon that must be slain by the hero Hercules. Chaos Conf myths were pretty much universal in the ancient world. Even where Leviathan and other sea dragons were not specifically mentioned, water and the sea usually were. Consider the opening chapter of Genesis, where God cuts the waters in half in order to create the heavens and earth. As it is written, and God made the firmament, and separated the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. Of course, the difference between the ancient pagan accounts of creation and the account of creation in Genesis is that God is in complete control during the creation account in Genesis. Whereas the counterpart example of Marduk, it's not quite sure if Marduk will end up defeating Tiamat or if Tiamat will defeat Marduk. But in Genesis, we see that from the very beginning, God was calmly hovering over the surface of the waters of chaos. In fact, the Hebrew word for deep here is Tehom, which many scholars actually believe is a variation on the name Tiamat, thus making the connection even stronger. According to Genesis 1, God took the waters underneath the firmament and created dry land in the midst of them. Thus, just like the Babylonian account of Tiamat and the creation narrative in Psalm 74, God created the world by cutting chaos in half and forming order in the midst of it. Thus, while I wish to dig into Genesis in more detail, for now just note that the whole point of the creation narrative is that God cut the waters in half in order to form a sacred space in the midst of them focused in Eden. Also, can you think of another example in scripture where God split the waters of chaos in order to create another sacred space? Now, if you love the Bible, this is where things are going to get really cool. After having victory over the lesser powerful gods of Egypt, Yahweh led his people to the Red Sea, where he split the waters in two, just like he did in Genesis. Even we see this as an amazing miracle, but for the ancient audience, this was much more. This was God defeating Leviathan again, and splitting the waters of chaos again, just like he did in Genesis. Only, instead of splitting them vertically, he split them horizontally, providing a highway of salvation for his people to enter the new Eden full of milk and honey. And by the way, this idea of a road of salvation is then picked up in the prophets, namely Isaiah, to prophesy about the salvation that we have in Jesus. For the Israelites, this wasn't just a cool miracle. This was new creation. It was just as significant as God creating the universe because he was again crushing Leviathan, the watery embodiment of chaos. 
The Exodus was no less significant than the creation of the world because they both involved salvation from Leviathan. So if I am right about the metaphorical interpretation of Leviathan, then Leviathan was indeed crushed when God split the Red Sea. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take a look at what Isaiah says in chapter 51. Awake, awake arm of the Lord, clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in the days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the midst of the sea, so that the redeemed might cross over? Those who the Lord has rescued will return, and they will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads, gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. As we have seen in Job, Rahab is another name for Leviathan. In this case, Isaiah associates the splitting of the Red Sea to be the piercing through of Leviathan. Rahab isn't just a dinosaur in the sea. Rahab Rahab is the sea. Yet Isaiah clearly draws on Leviathan and new creation themes in Exodus to then prophesy about the redeemed returning to Zion, which is to be fulfilled in Jesus. All of these things are connected because scripture is one beautiful story. Psalm 89 likewise attributes the crushing of Rahab to Yahweh, although it is unclear whether this is referring to Genesis or Exodus. Yet, even so, chaos still exists in the world. Yes, God did defeat Leviathan in Genesis and in Exodus, but we are still surrounded surrounded by danger. People still have cancer. People are still dying. There is suffering all around us. So Leviathan still very much needs to be defeated again. But there will be a day when God will defeat Leviathan ultimately, and this time Leviathan will be no more. There will be no sea because the chaos waters of death have gone. And if the idea of there being no sea sounds familiar, then that's just another hint of where this video is going. And that is what Isaiah 27 is all about. That is why it is so natural for Isaiah to think of God's miraculous destruction of chaos as the killing of Leviathan. Because for Isaiah and the entire ancient world, Leviathan is the personification of chaos. And that's why God must kill him on the last day. As Christians, we know that this happens at Jesus' return. This is when God completes the new creation that he started in the Exodus by forming the new heavens and the new earth. But if Leviathan is just a metaphor for chaos, then it makes sense why he would be described as destructive. But why would he be described as a destructive sea monster? In the ancient world, the ocean was seen as the representative of chaos, evil, and death. In fact, many texts use the sea as a way of speaking about the realm of the dead. For example, Ezekiel, in prophesying about the doom of those in Tyre, uses the sea to describe where they will end up when they die. The reason why you see that not only in Babylonian material, but also in lots of other material, is that the sea was otherworldly to an ancient Near Eastern person, really any ancient person. And it's because it isn't where people live. You can't live in the sea. You can't live in the sea. The sea is chaotic. It's untamable. It's wild. It's threatening. You'll die if you're not you know, on a boat, you know, that, that kind of thing. It, it, it's unpredictable. The sea was an otherworldly place. You'll actually get, they'll equate the sea with the afterlife or, or the netherworld because to them it spoke of unpredictability and death and, and humans can't live there. When you're out on the sea in a boat and you see big animals in it, you know, whether they're whales or sharks or whatever it is, you tend to associate those things, these huge creatures that, again, don't live on land. They're not things you normally see, but they live in this otherworldly place. They lend themselves to, again, being portrayals, symbolic portrayals of that place. And that's why you have in the ancient Near East a lot of this kind of symbology, great sea creatures that represent chaos and death and disorder and all this kind of stuff. A perfect example of this is the story of Jonah. Here, Jonah is stuck on a boat in the middle of the ocean. When the sea is thrown into turmoil, each man prays to his god in hopes that they can be delivered from the great storm. Yet none of these false gods can deliver them from the certain doom of the sea, both the literal sea and the sea as in the realm of the dead. They are doomed while Jonah is fast asleep in the inner part of the ship. Eventually, Jonah admits that the storm is a result of his flight from Yahweh and tells the men to throw him overboard. The men tried to row back to dry land, but eventually did indeed throw him overboard, causing the sea to quiet down. Interestingly, this threw the men into great fear of Yahweh because Yahweh demonstrated that he was the only God who truly had the power to calm the sea. As Job 41 puts it, he is the only one who has the power 
power to stop and defeat Leviathan. The story of Jonah is the perfect illustration of Leviathan. In the storm, the men were surrounded by death and the realm of the dead, namely the sea. In very real terms, they were under attack by Leviathan. Yet even so, Leviathan was merely doing the bidding of Yahweh to accomplish his plan. And there is an important lesson here. When the waters of chaos and destruction and calamity come upon us in our own lives, we know that Leviathan is on a leash. Chaos, evil, and destruction can only do what God allows them to do. God is always in control, even when it doesn't seem like he is. And there's actually more to the story of Jonah than you may have heard in Sunday school. For example, we have discovered Jewish Midrash traditions that claim that the fish was actually a Leviathan. While these texts post-date Jonah by over a thousand years, it is interesting that some commentators went in the Leviathan direction. Based on what we already know about Leviathan, it would be quite natural to place Leviathan in such a story. However, what's even more interesting about the fish of Jonah is that early depictions of him in Christian iconography, paintings, and sculptures tend to represent him as a dragon. Yet the Hebrew text of Jonah itself simply uses the ordinary word for fish. What are ancient Christians seeing in the story of Jonah that modern Christians simply don't see? One very likely contribution to this fact is the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is just the uh, ancient Greek translation of the original Hebrew scriptures. Now, interestingly, the Septuagint, instead of using the word for fish, uses the word for sea monster in the story of Jonah. Now, usually when translating the Hebrew word dog, meaning fish, into Greek, the Septuagint uses the word ichthys, meaning fish every single time, until we get to the story of Jonah. When translating this same word dog in the story of Jonah, the Septuagint renders it as katos. And katos actually means sea monster. As Dr. Scott Nogel points out in his article titled Jonah and Leviathan, Inner Biblical Illusions and the Problem with Dragons, early Christian depictions of Jonah's fish as a sea dragon have long posed a problem for scholars. Some have explained it by pointing to the Septuagint's rendering of Jonah's fish as katos, sea creature. Yet this translation itself is problematic, since it is completely out of step with the treatments of the term dog, fish, elsewhere in the Bible. Dr. Nogle then goes on to point to a number of biblical allusions to Leviathan in the story of Jonah that would push both the Christians and the Septuagint translators in the Leviathan direction. Firstly, when we read the text, the text actually says that the wind was in the sea, not on the sea, as if the waves were actually caused by the beast like Leviathan in Job 41. Secondly, Nogle brings a strong case that Jonah uses a specific rare Hebrew word in chapter 1 verse 13, to reference Amos 9-2, and the context of Amos 9 mentions the realm of the dead paralleled with the Sea of Jonah, along with a reference to a serpentine dragon. Thirdly, Nogal points out that the prayer of Jonah 2 uses a number of specific words that point to specific Leviathan passages. For example, he points out that Metsula, or deep, is always used in connection with either Leviathan or the Exodus, which itself is associated with Leviathan. Additionally, the prayer of chapter 2 describes Jonah as being in the belly of Sheol, as if the realm of the dead is a great monster with the ability to swallow individuals. This is in lockstep with other texts that describe the realm of the dead as a monster with an insatiable appetite. No matter how many people the realm of the dead eats, it is never enough. In fact, the prayer of Jonah is filled with cosmic descriptions that echo Leviathan imagery. However, what's most interesting is that verse 3 says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the nahar surrounding me. Commenting on Nahar in this text, Nogal writes that the term most often refers generally to a river, stream, or canal, to a specific river such as the Nile or Euphrates. However, when used synonymously with the deep, it refers to the cosmological waters that Yahweh rebukes and or cleaves. Even when used figuratively, it does not mean flood but rather stream. Thus, its appearance immediately after the word yamim, seas, emits cosmological reverberations, and recalls the age-old identification of the river with Leviathan, as attested in Ugaritic texts in the creature's other name. Dr. Mike Heiser actually picks up on the use of nahar and points out that the word technically means serpent. Let's look at the verb. The nahar surrounds Jonah. The verb there is sabab. It means to encircle, as in the course of a river that twists its way through a territory. The word is used in Genesis 2 of the Pishon and the Gihon, how the river winds its way through a, you know, a piece of earth. Of course, Leviathan is a twisting, undulating serpent, and serpents encircle their prey, do they not? I mean, you know, Isaiah 27.1 gives us you know, this, this sort of imagery. In Ugaritic texts, 
Leviathan has another name, and his name is Nahar. (laughs) In the Baal cycle, Baal becomes king of the gods when he defeats Nahar. Again, Nahar is is, his his deity cosmic rival. And again, Nahar is also referred to as Leviathan. So so Baal is the one who overcomes chaos and becomes king of the gods and and is in control of everything. He's such a wonderful dude, blah, 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 blah. This is Canaanite religion. It's Canaanite theology 101. Well, here in Jonah, Nahar surrounded me the harp overcame me. and he's just referred to the waters that he goes into as the as the womb of sheol the, the realm of the dead baal again in canaanite literature who defeats nahar and becomes king of the gods Baal is Lord of the Dead. He is Lord of Sheol. So what then do we have in Jonah? What most likely happened is Jonah was swallowed by a whale or a large fish that God summoned. But then in the retelling and the writing of the story, the author of Jonah chooses to clothe the whole story in Leviathan images. He is pointing to different Leviathan texts and he's dropping clues here and there. And he's hoping that you'll sort of pick up on these breadcrumbs and realize what's going on. We're starting to stack these Sheol... Nahar, serpent, sea serpent kind of things. We're, we're, we're seeing them just sort of light up as we work our way through Jonah. They're just nuggets that are kind of embedded in the text that the writer's hoping you start to collect them and start to notice them. You, you build a collection of these things and they're all going to essentially point to the same idea. Whether or not the fish of Jonah is a Leviathan, what is clear is that the story of Jonah is definitely about Leviathan. And we can't talk about Jonah without talking about the greater Jonah. Just look at how much more depth this adds to Jesus' claim that Jonah was a sign of his own death and resurrection. You see, looking at the story through ancient eyes, the story of Jonah is not about just some guy getting swallowed by a fish for a few days. It is about Jonah descending into the belly of the beast of Sheol. It is about him falling into the realm of death, the very waters of chaos that overtakes all of us eventually. It's about Jonah being swallowed by Leviathan, but eventually being resurrected out of the belly of death incarnate to go and deliver the message of salvation to the Gentiles. And by the way, Jonah volunteered to sacrifice himself in order to save a group of sinners from death from Leviathan. Jesus is really saying that he too will descend into the belly of Leviathan, but will return from the realm of the dead with the keys of Hades in hand. This was deep and significant and thick imagery, just as significant as Jesus finding himself asleep on a boat in a storm just like Jonah. Only in this story, Jesus proves that he is able to control Leviathan by walking all over him. And this shows that he is indeed God. Just as God tamed Leviathan by calming the storm in Jonah, Jesus does the same, fulfilling the role that only God can have according to Job 41. In fact, just like the Exodus, Jesus comes to kill Leviathan by entering his own belly and splitting him in two to form a highway for sinners to cross from Sheol to the new Eden and the new Jerusalem, just like Isaiah originally prophesied. And that's why if you're still stuck on Leviathan as a dinosaur, then you are going to miss all of that. You just won't know what the whole story is all about because you don't know what Leviathan is and how Jesus is going to defeat him. You see, Jesus isn't done with Leviathan. According to 1 Corinthians 15, right when Jesus comes back and raptures his church, then he will ultimately slay the last enemy, which is Leviathan. This is exactly like what we have already read in Isaiah. 27 and what we will eventually read in Revelation. And let me tell you, Revelation's use of Leviathan is incredible. However, as much as I would like to go into Revelation, in order to get the keys to understand Leviathan, we need to go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 29 contains a prophecy against the nation of Egypt, and in it, God actually describes Egypt as a dragon that lies in the midst of his streams. By now, based on all we've learned, Leviathan instantly now comes to mind for us as it would have for the original audience. God promises to put hooks in Egypt's jaws and throw him out into the desert where he will be eaten by the birds and the beasts. So here we have a number of interesting things to note. Number one, a nation of people can be described as Leviathan. This is very interesting and it proves that Leviathan is not just natural disasters such as tsunamis, earthquakes, and famines. Each of us, and indeed entire nations, when we align ourselves with evil and oppose God's plan, we become agents of chaos. We are supporting Leviathan and essentially become part of Leviathan. Therefore, earthly battles are not just physical. There are cosmic, spiritual forces at work, and the real question is whose side are you on? Are you on the side of evil and chaos, or are you on the side of God? Even in the story of Jonah, Nogal points out that Leviathan language is applied to Jonah himself when he runs away from God's plan for his life. So in Jonah, we see that even we as believers, when we sin, 
sin. And when we disobey God, we are actually supporting Leviathan. When we aren't serving God, we are serving Satan. However, here in Ezekiel, we see that the reference isn't to an individual, but rather to an entire nation who is on the side of evil. The second thing to note about Ezekiel 29 is that we find that Egypt is described as a dragon that is lying down and not doing anything. To see why this description makes sense, we need to know a little bit about biblical history. When Babylon became a threat to the nation of Israel, the Israelites decided to turn to the nation of Egypt for protection. Instead of forming a covenant with their own god and turning towards Yahweh for protection, they actually turned towards the pagans, which was very much against God's plan. Yet when the time came, Egypt ended up doing nothing about the Babylonian invasion. Therefore, just like Jonah, by not doing what they were supposed to do, they ended up becoming agents of chaos. Yet they were a lazy, inept agent, which is why they are described as laying down. Therefore, God accuses them of breaking trust when Israel leaned on them. Isaiah 30 also echoes this sentiment by saying, Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who sits still. Thirdly, notice that Leviathan is thrown down into the wilderness. It hardly makes sense if this is literal because a sea creature wouldn't be thrown into the desert. However, if you're thinking more symbolically, then it makes perfect sense. The desert is also a place of death where survival is difficult. The desert is the realm of Satan and is the opposite of Eden, which is a garden. God is saying that he will throw Leviathan, who is Egypt, to the place of death to die. Lastly, pay attention to the idea that all the birds and beasts will feed on Leviathan. This is actually common imagery for divine punishment of Leviathan, which we've already seen in Psalm 74. Also note that in Psalm 74, Leviathan is again cast into the wilderness, just like here in Ezekiel. The picture here in Ezekiel is that when a nation aligns themselves with Leviathan, God will eventually come to punish them. And according to Jeremiah, sometimes God uses the sea itself in order to punish Leviathan. How Babylon is taken. The praise of the whole earth is seized. How Babylon has become a horror among the nations. The sea has come up on Babylon. Babylon. She is covered with its tumultuous waves, her cities have become a horror, and the land of drought and desert, a land in which no one dwells, and through which no son of man passes. And I will punish Bel in Babylon, and I will take out of his mouth what he has swallowed. The nations shall no longer flow to him, the wall of Babylon has fallen. Here Babylon, the Leviathan, will be punished, and God will seize those whom Leviathan has swallowed. He will seize the people who have been killed by Babylon, and he will retrieve them out of the mouth of the beast. In other words, he will raise them back to life. Therefore, here in Jeremiah, God is promising resurrection out of the mouth of Leviathan while killing Leviathan with his own sea. Again, this is just like Isaiah 27, where death is defeated at the same time Leviathan is destroyed. Yet now, based on Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we know that the defeat of Leviathan isn't just the ending of hurricanes. It is also the destruction of the people who are on the side of Leviathan. When Jesus returns, he will kill the serpent and all those who are a part of it. Later in Ezekiel 32, we see that Pharaoh and Egypt are again called a dragon, yet God is going to fling Leviathan onto the ground and drench the land with his carcass. And again, we see the common imagery of birds and beasts eating the flesh of Leviathan. However, the most interesting passage in Ezekiel is chapters 38 and 39. This is the famous end times battle of Gog and Magog. According to Revelation 20, we know that the battle of Gog and Magog occurs at the end of the millennium, which gives us a solid anchor point for when this passage is going to be fulfilled. In chapter 38, we read that God will put hooks in the jaws of Gog to lure him out to battle. This language of hooks in jaws is clear Leviathan imagery, since Ezekiel himself used it earlier to describe the defeat of Egypt as Leviathan. However, now in the end times, Gog, the ultimate representative of Leviathan, will be drawn out of the sea of chaos where he resides to ultimately be slain. Therefore, Gog comes out from his place to attack the people of God, where he is then killed on the mountains of Israel. Then, to confirm the Leviathan imagery, Ezekiel provides an extended description of the ultimate end times Leviathan being eaten by the birds of the air. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God. Speak to the birds of every sort and to all the beasts of the field. Assemble and come. Gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and of lambs and of he goats and of bulls and all of them fat beasts of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk. 
at the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, and you shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots and mighty men and all kinds of warriors, declares the Lord God. We know this language applies to Leviathan because the feeding of the birds and the beasts on Leviathan's flesh has been repeated multiple times in Ezekiel and elsewhere. This is why, if by this point you don't know what Leviathan imagery looks like, then you will miss the entire point of what Ezekiel is doing here. He is purposefully presenting this battle of Gog and Magog as the last battle of God versus Leviathan. And as we know as Christians, this is going to happen when Jesus returns, just as Isaiah 27 prophesied. And this brings us to Revelation 19, where we see the ultimate fulfillment of these chapters in Ezekiel 38 and 39. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. The similarities of this text and Ezekiel 39 are abundant. John is obviously portraying Jesus' return on a white horse to defeat Leviathan as the fulfillment of Gog and Magog. But wait a minute, you might be thinking, doesn't the battle of Gog and Magog happen at the end of the millennium, not the beginning of the millennium? And at this, you would be correct. However, we also know that this is fulfilled at the return of Jesus, according to chapter 19. This means that according to the book of Revelation, the end of the millennium and the return of Jesus are the same event. The only conclusion that we can draw then is that we are currently in the millennium and are awaiting Jesus to return and destroy Gog. But aside from the millennium debate, now that we understand Leviathan imagery in Ezekiel, we can properly understand how John parallels the language of birds feeding in order to portray Jesus coming as the destruction of Leviathan, the great enemy. In fact, John already introduced Leviathan way back in chapter 12. Here we read about a seven-headed dragon that is also identified as a serpent. Now, can you think of anywhere where you've heard about a seven headed serpentine dragon. That's what Leviathan is, and John is using this to clearly apply Leviathan imagery to Satan. Yet this raises another question. Is Leviathan just another name for Satan? One could be forgiven for thinking that Leviathan and Satan are exactly the same, because both are described as dragons, both are described as agents of chaos, both are evil, both have seven heads, and both are serpentine. Also, both appear in both Revelation and Genesis. However, there are a number of reasons to think that Satan and Leviathan aren't actually identical. First, we've already seen that Leviathan is made up of people or nations such as Egypt and Babylon, Satan is an individual entity who is not comprised of people. Additionally, Satan may or may not be able to cause natural disasters, but we cannot say that these natural disasters are Satan, in the same sense that we can say that they are Leviathan. Lastly, there is nothing in chapter 12 to say that Satan lives in the sea like Leviathan. Yet, Satan is indeed an agent of chaos, which is why John uses Leviathan images and applies them to Satan. Of course, the biggest reason that we know Satan is not Leviathan is that Leviathan imagery is also shared with the first beast. Notice how Satan stands at the sea in order to beckon to another seven-headed sea monster to rise up. So the idea here is clear. Both Satan and the first beast are indeed Leviathan, because together they represent the forces of evil and chaos in the world. Borrowing on the symbolism of Daniel 7, Revelation 13 describes the beast as a combination of a bear, lion, and leopard. However, even though it has fur, it is still obvious that this is Leviathan. The beast still comes up out of the sea and has seven heads like Leviathan, yet it is also clearly meant to parallel the description of Satan who looks like a dragon. Yet Satan does not share the water-dwelling aspect like the beast. It seems here that Satan does not embody all of the attributes of Leviathan because Leviathan is more than just Satan. Uh, additionally, the first beast does not embody all of the attributes of Leviathan because Leviathan is more than just the first beast. These individuals themselves are only a part of Leviathan. Now, as far as the second beast of Revelation 13, 
scene that is described as a land beast. I won't get into this in too much detail. Spoiler alert, I think this is a reference to Behemoth and Leviathan, the water beast and the land beast of Job 41, but I haven't really gone into Behemoth imagery yet, so I will save that for a future video. However, just notice for now that he speaks like a dragon, noting that he is definitely on the same side as Leviathan. As far as the lion, bear, and leopard imagery, these descriptions are clearly taken from Daniel 7, where the lion represents the Babylonian Empire, the bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire, and the leopard represents the Greek Empire. In Daniel, each beast is an empire, and also according to Daniel, each empire comes out of the sea. Now remember, the sea represents all of the chaotic forces of anti-Eden. Therefore, even here in Daniel, we see this Leviathan-type language. Now returning again to Revelation, this helps us understand that the first beast is sort of an amalgamation of all of the previous incarnations of Leviathan. Just as Egypt was considered Leviathan by Ezekiel, John considers each beast to be another form of the beast. And in Revelation, this leads to one of two different possibilities. Either the beast of Revelation 13 is one singular empire that exhibits all of the different attributes of the different empires in the book of Daniel, or the beast in Revelation 13 actually represents all empires throughout all of church history. Now, either way you lean in that direction, it is clear that the beast is not the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist might be a leader at the head of the empire, which is the beast, but the Antichrist himself is not the beast. Much like Pharaoh is associated with Leviathan and Ezekiel, but really it's all of Egypt who are Leviathan in chapter 32, or how in Ezekiel 38, Gog is the chief prince of Leviathan, but it is all of Gog's hordes that together represent Leviathan. In fact, the parallels between Gog and the Antichrist are so prevalent that we can only be led to the conclusion that the Antichrist and Gog are the same individual. Both are the head of a nation that is Leviathan, and both are slaughtered in the end times when Jesus returns. Again, this is another example of why we know that we are currently in the millennium. In fact, a pre-millennial view makes absolutely no sense of what scripture says about Leviathan. When Jesus returns, is he going to kill Leviathan or isn't he? Is Isaiah 27 going to be fulfilled or isn't it? Is Gog and all of the hordes of chaos going to be destroyed or aren't they? Will Satan be ultimately defeated or won't he? Is Jesus going to defeat the last enemy that is death when he returns or isn't he? The millennium just throws an obtuse wrench in God's beautiful story. And speaking of the end of the millennium, take a look at what we read in chapter 20 right after Satan is defeated. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them according to what they had done. Richard Bauckham goes into this text in great detail in his book, The Climax of Prophecy, and shows that John is drawing on a known apocalyptic tradition, where the realm of the dead is called to return those who have been entrusted to it. He argues that the sea in this verse doesn't just refer to people who happen to have died offshore, but rather the sea is another term for the cosmological waters of chaos that represent the realm of the dead. Verse 13 also strongly resembles what we read in Jeremiah 51, where God promises to raise those who have been swallowed by Marduk and Babylon. And not only are the dead taken from Leviathan, but both Leviathan and death are ultimately destroyed as verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And then immediately in chapter 21 we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Some people find it strange that the sea is no more, but by now I'm hoping you understand that this is not about there being no oceans, this is about the cosmological waters of chaos, death, destruction, and evil that surround us, the realm of the dead, all these things are gone. All of the forces of Leviathan have been utterly extinguished and annihilated, because now we are in the perfect paradise of God's wonderful new creation. In other words, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. The story of Leviathan is not about a dinosaur. It is about how God is going to come, and he is going to defeat chaos forever. 
Leviathan is going to be destroyed because Jesus is going to return to complete the new creation that he started, to destroy death and suffering forever. It has no victory over us as Christians. We do not need to be afraid of Leviathan or the realm of the dead because we have been saved in Christ and we are awaiting a new creation. And that is what the story of Leviathan is all about.